continue with the talk by Melody Chan from Brown University, who speaks on the top weight rational cohomology of the modular space of Abelian varieties. Please. Thank you, Dirk, and thank you so much for having me here at this conference virtually. I, I apologize that I wasn't able to come in person. Um, let me tell you about this project, which is joint with the following five authors. Uh, Madeline Brandt and Juliet Bruce are current postdocs. Margarita Mello and I led this project. Um, and uh, Gwen Moreland and Corey Wolf are uh, finishing graduate students. And um, let me start actually with a bunch of acknowledgments. So this was a project that we started um, at a virtual ISOM workshop, Women in Algebraic Geometry, which I was fortunate to co-organize with Antonella Grassi, Rohini Ramadas, Julie Rana, and Isabel Vogt. Uh, this was the virtual summer of 2020. And um, I wanna acknowledge right from the uh, outset that our project benefited a lot from the uh, previous computational work of uh, due to um, Philippe Elbaz Vincent, Herbert Gangle, and Christophe Soulet. And we also benefited quite a lot from very enlightening observations um, communicated to us by Ursula Tomasi, which I will hope to discuss by the end of this talk. Um, and final acknowledgement is that I want to thank um, Francis Brown, Soren Galatius, Sam Grzeszewski, and Sam Payne um, for um, ongoing conversations. Um, uh, they, while I don't exactly have a, a paper at the moment to point you to, um, our conversations in progress have really shaped um, the way that I can tell you the, the way I understand the story that I'm going to try to tell you today. So this is a talk on the, the rational cohomology of AG. So, you know, unlike Francis, I am, you know, neither able to speak today about graph complexes nor quantum field theory. And I don't even have the and accessible in this talk, but hopefully there will be some um, aspects of this work that connect to some of the very interesting talks we've seen so far in various ways. So I hope that there will be some some potential, you know, um, uh, points of, of entry that are interesting to a number of um, people in the audience. So let me start. Oops. So the main space uh, that's the central character of this talk is the space classically denoted AG. I'll work over the complex numbers. So I mean the complex moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension G. And the fastest way for me to uh, define this space um, is to bypass abelian varieties and give it to you directly as the quotient of a contractible space by a group action. So that contractible space is denoted here, um, HG, this is known as the Ziegel upper half plane. And um, you can regard it as a sort of analog, a higher dimensional analog of the complex upper half plane. So in case this is new, I'm happy to define it. It, it is defined as um, the space of G by G symmetric matrices over the complex numbers with the property that the imaginary part uh, regarded now as a real symmetric matrix is positive definite. And there is a natural action of the symplectic group SP2G with integer entries on this um, the space AG, um, which is written here on the right. So it's an analog of the usual action of SL2Z on the usual upper half plane. And that is, you can, you can take it as a definition of the space AG. My goal then is to study the 
cohomology with rational coefficients of AG. Now, you can see from our description of HG that it's contractible. And the action of the symplectic group is nice enough that uh, we are equivalently studying the rational cohomology of SP2GZ. Now, the description I gave you doesn't actually make evident the most, you know, the, the, the most useful property of AG that's going to play a role in this talk, namely the property that AG is actually a complex variety. So it would be similar to defining MG as the quotient of Teichmiller space by the action of the mapping class group, which by itself doesn't make the variety structure evident. But the fact that AG is a variety is of um, importance to, to our perspective. So for now, let me just claim that it's a variety. Um, and better, it's, it's better regarded um, as a Deline Mumford stack. So it's an orbifold type structure and it's smooth and separated as a stack. And let me record, um, you know, while I'm on the subject, it's dimension. So it's dimension as a complex variety is G plus one times G over two, which actually is already evident from our definition of HG above. So taking this statement as true, which it is, let me um, sort of establish in the, in the context of this talk that the rational cohomology of any variety X, so a complex variety X, in particular X need not be smooth and it need not be projective, is equipped with extra structure, namely the, the structure of, um, namely a mixed Hodge structure in the sense of Deline's work, Deline's work from the 70s. So by this, by mixed Hodge structure, I mean the following extra data. There is a canonical weight filtration increasing, indexed in an increasing manner um, on the rational cohomology groups as shown here on the left. With the property that the associated graded pieces of this weight filtration, which I'm denoting here, GER sub J. So by definition, this is just the J piece mod the J minus first piece. So with the property that these associated graders um, in, in weight J are equipped, you know, canonically with the structure of a pure Hobbes structure of weight J. And said with a little more detail, those pure Hodge structures are simultaneously um, for all J, induced by a descending filtration here on the right on the complexification of the rational cohomology. So the cohomology of complex coefficients, which we call the Hodge filtration. Okay. And this association of mixed Hodge structures to the cohomology groups, the rational cohomology of varieties um, is functorial and it's compatible with, I mean, I'm just asserting, I'm not proving this, but I'm asserting that um, these structures are compatible with, um, um, you know, things like things that you would expect like long exact sequences of compactly supported cohomology and Poincaré duality, which I'll write out here. So if X is a smooth variety, um, say of complex dimension D. So let me assume it's irreducible and smooth. Then there's a mixed Hodge structure on the compactly supported cohomology um, as well of X with rational coefficients. And the, um, the point is that the weight filtration is compatible with Poincaré duality. So the graded um, GR sub J of HI here 
Um, and here I'm just writing as a vector space. So just as a vector space, this is dual to um, the um, cohomology degree 2D minus I compactly supported now in weight 2D minus J. So in particular, if you accept that fact, then it would follow just from Poincaré duality considerations that the cohomology of X can never appear in weight above 2D. So I've sort of written that special case. So when, um, when J equals 2D, then we call the, the weight you know, 2D uh, quotient uh, on the left, the top weight cohomology. It's dual to the weight zero compactly supported cohomology here on the right. And the reason we call it top weight again is that, again, from, you can see from Poincaré duality that you can't have cohomology in, in weights above 2D. So now I can refine um, or maybe sort of narrow the scope of this talk, which is we propose to discuss the cohomology of AG specifically in top weight. In, in the sense written on the board. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. So um, I'm just gonna now announce the main results of the joint work that I'm presenting, and then we'll circle back and you know discuss techniques and proofs. So here's the result announcement. So. The main result of this six author paper is, is, a, is the following computational results for the top weight cohomology of A5, A6, and A7. And let me say right away that we deduce these computations. We, we rely heavily on the uh, computations of um, EVGS, as I mentioned before. It's not to say that they're direct from those results, but we absolutely need them. This theorem constitutes a complete characterization of the top weight cohomology groups of A5, A6, and A7. The ones that are circled in green, I will uh, perhaps circle back to this, but just in case I don't, those were already identified in, uh, I guess in, in, in two talks um, so far, in the talks of Oliver and Francis, these correspond to um, the wheels of genus five and genus seven. But at the time that we wrote the paper, that was, um, yeah, I mean, that, that the, the timeline is a little bit inverted here. So that's something I can say now uh, that I couldn't necessarily say two years ago. So that's our main computational result. So I should probably back up and explain why we started at G equals five. Oh, let me also mention there's nothing scary about these rather large numbers, 30, 42, and 56. That's just um, the number G squared plus G, in other words, twice the complex dimension of AG for G equals five, six, or seven. And if you wish, you can um, take Poincare duals and pass to weight zero compactly supported cohomology if that makes you happier. Okay, so now let me briefly discuss the, the smaller cases. Oh, sorry, before I do that, let me also announce some vanishing results that we're able to obtain for genera eight, nine, and 10. So these vanishing results, they're slightly better um, than the existing sort of vanishing that you would deduce from, the, from just knowing the virtual cohomological dimension of symplectic groups, SP2GZ. Um, and I'll try to show you a table later that makes these six statements a little bit more evident. It will be a table of results that's actually the um, E1 page of a certain spectral sequence. So hopefully in a bit, we can revisit this data um, in maybe a more visually compelling way. Um, and these vanishing results, I should mention, we deduce sort of through the same pipeline 
um, from uh, and not, you know from corresponding vanishing results in a paper of Dutour, Securich, Albez, Vincent, Coopers, and Martinet. Okay, so those are our main theorems. So the, the history is as follows. So these computations are known for A2, A3, and A4. The case of A2 is classical, I think due to Igusa, and there's no top weight cohomology. The case of A3 is most interesting. So there is a top weight cohomology class um, uh, due to, uh, which was um, sort of proved in work of Hain. So more specifically, Hain shows that the cohomology group H6 of A3 is like a non-trivial mixture, a non-trivial mixed Hodge structure. And what we're picking up is this part here, the Q minus six. Um, and through the sort of translational machinery that we will hopefully um, expand on during this talk, we'll sort of reinterpret this, this top weight class uh, that was discovered in Haynes' work as corresponding to wheel three or the graph K4. And finally, um, the, the case of A4 can be deduced from the work of Hulek and Tomasi, and I'm grateful to Ursula for explaining how to do that. Um, it's remarkable that the cohomology ring of A4 already in genus four is not fully understood. Um, but experts like Hulek Tomasi know a lot about it and are able to deduce from their sort of partial results that the top weight groups, uh, the top weight cohomology vanishes. Okay, so that's why our computations start at g equals five. So one more remark before, you know, to, to, to situate our, our results before proceeding further. Um, it's a sort of simple-minded remark, which is that we are actually finding cohomology of AG in odd degrees. Um, you know, in the literal sense that some of the Ks that I wrote down, I guess 15, 33, and 37 are odd numbers. Um, but these are the first instances of explicitly known sort of non-vanishing cohomology groups of AG in odd degree. And this was highlighted in a survey from about 12 years ago now um, by Sam Grzeszewski. Um, so this is a very extensive uh, survey called the geometry of AG and its compactifications. And in particular, open problem seven was to identify uh, odd degree cohomology groups, non-vanishing of AG or any of its compactifications. Now, unlike the case of MG, where the work of Harazagi shows that, you know, for G even, Euler characteristics of MG are massively negative, and therefore there must have been tons of odd degree cohomology somewhere. I'm unaware of a similar sort of, you know, Euler characteristic results of, uh, regarding AG that would say that such groups have to exist. Um, although I'm happy to be corrected by, by anyone who knows otherwise. Nevertheless, this was an open problem, um, which we have made some progress on. Okay. <clears throat> so let me just now, um, if I remember my notes right, put up a table that is just a sort of um, rough comparison between MG and AG, especially because MG and its, its uh, top weight, or in fact, weight two cohomology has been the subject of, um, has come up in several talks so far. So I wanna sort of give a rough mental comparison because the techniques that we use in studying AG in the six author paper are very much in the spirit of um, the work, prior work with Galatius and Payne. So here's the table. So we have MG and AG, which as I mentioned, can be presented in this way as quotients of contractible spaces by mapping class groups slash symplectic group respectively. And in the, in the situation of MG, you may recall, or let me tell you if you don't recall, that the 
the Lee Mumford compactification MG bar was very important in the way we were able to study the top weight cohomology of MG, again, and work with Galatius and Payne. So in particular, MG bar is a normal crossings compactification, which means that the boundary of MG bar is um, locally isomorphic to a um, intersection of transverse hyperplanes. So the situation with AG is different. So basically the, the my talk is gonna focus on, you know, stuff in this lower right corner. So I will assert the existence of um, a toroidal compactification of AG for some input combinatorial data, sigma, uh, which is called an admissible decomposition in the literature. A toroidal compactification is a slight generalization of normal crossings compactification. Here, the boundary is required to look locally like the complement of a torus inside a normal toric variety. So that includes normal crossings as a special case. So I'll discuss these toroidal compactifications, which are due to Ash, Mumford, Rappaport, and Tai. And uh, I will especially focus not so much on the actual construction of the compactification, but on the um, attendant combinatorics. That combinatorics is then uh, sort of crystallized into a tropical moduli space, AG trog comma sigma, where sigma is again that input combinatorics that I will define for you. And as in the previous talks, e.g. the one this morning, um, the tropical moduli space is built out of cones, so it itself is contractible. But what's quite interesting and is not at all topologically trivial is the link or the slice of tropical moduli space of AG trop. So that is that functions as a dual complex. Um, roughly speaking, encoding the combinatorics at the boundary of the toroidal compactification, AG bar sigma. And that, so this is roughly speaking an AG analog of the um, tropical moduli space MG trop of curves called um, delta G in the literature or, some, or the link of MG trop. And I'll discuss a little bit the sort of data type of the link. AG trop, the link of AG trop. So in CGP, we use the formalism that is called um, symmetric delta complexes there in the literature. It's a formalism that's been around um, this, this kind of idea of a um, something that's like a CW complex, but with some self identifications allowed. So e.g. in the work of Berkovich and separately hatcher votman there are similar structures considered. Um, and then on the right, we need something a little bit more relaxed as category than symmetric delta complexes. So it's the formalism, most convenient for us is the formalism of symmetric CW complexes as developed in the work of um, Alcock, Corey, and Payne, which is something like a CW complex, but again, with some finite um, automorphisms along which gluings are permitted on cells. Okay, and then the punchline, which essentially is the work of Deline um, applied in these cases, is that just as studying the rational homology of tropical moduli spaces um, tells us exactly the top weight cohomology of MG, studying the rational homology of tropical moduli spaces of abelian varieties tells us about the top weight cohomology of AG. So again, this is the work of Deline um, in essence, but you can see some details um, in the two respective papers. So I'll mention that AG trop does have a sort of combinatorial um, modular interpretation. It parameterizes isomorphism classes of what's called tropical abelian varieties, principally polarized of of real dimension G. Um, that's not a perspective that I need. So I don't need in particular the sort of 
the, the modular, the combinatorial description, sorry, the description of AG trap is itself a combinatorial moduli space. But that's an interesting story. And I can refer you to, in the tropical literature, work of Mikhail Kinjarkov and Bernetti Mello Viviani for that description. But we don't need it for this, for this story. Okay. So unless there are questions, I'll, I'll jump in and describe the sort of bottom right of this, this um, sort of outline. Starting with, I think, um, admissible decompositions. Okay. So some of this will be recollections from the first talk of this morning of Francis's. So I'll denote by omega G rational, the, um, it's a partial closure of the positive semi-definite cone. So by this, I mean, sitting inside the real vector space of symmetric G by G matrices, you consider those matrices X that are um, positive semi-definite and whose kernel is rational, is defined over Q. So that certainly includes all positive definite matrices. So this is some kind of partial compactification or partial closure, I guess, of the positive semi-definite, sorry, the positive definite cone. And as was recalled this morning, there is a conjugation act action of GLGZ. Oh, sorry, that's supposed to say transpose. Okay. So the following combinatorics is quite classical. I mean, in fact, it's probably correct to attribute it to Voronoi, Voronoi's work from more than a century ago. Um, and it's, I think, remarkable that it's, it's coming up again in this context. So we define the following. An admissible decomposition of omega G rational, it's a face-to-face -face polyhedral cone decomposition, I'll call it sigma, into a bunch of rational polyhedral cones, sigma i, with some finiteness property with respect to the action of GLGZ. So the requirement, so sorry, do you know what I mean? So you have some, <laughs> let me draw the only picture that's possible to draw. Uh, at the moment, it'll just be a cartoon sketch, but this is actually a correct picture on some level. So here is a picture of the space of um, two by two positive semi-definite matrices. What it actually is, is there's some round cone in a you know, three-dimensional real vector space. And uh, to make the drawing easier, I've chosen to slice the cone. For example, you can take the trace one slice or something like that. So the space omega G rational is the stuff in the interior together with, you know, some set of points. So all of those um, matrices with um, you know, one dimensional null space defined over the rationals. So this is a picture of omega G rational, uh, omega two rational in this case. So an admissible, decom admissible decomposition is some decomposition of this round cone into necessarily infinite collection of polyhedral cones that meet face to face. Um, so it will, in the case G equals two, there are some famous choices of admissible decomposition and in G equals two, they all coincide and look like this. So that's what I mean. There's infinitely many polyhedral cones. They meet face to face. So the intersection of any two is a face of each um, and the collection of cones is closed under taking faces. Moreover, there's a finiteness with respect to the action of the general linear group, GLGZ, which is required to permute cones. So it sends cones of sigma to cones of sigma. That could include, for example, um, self-identifications of, of cones. And we require that there are only finitely many orbits of cones under this action. It's not perhaps clear that these exist, but they do. And then let me assert more or less as a black box in the context of this talk that the work of Ash Mumford Rappaport Tai produces a toroidal compactification 
of AG, depending on the input sort of combinatorial data, sigma. And so I'll write AG bar sigma for that compactification. What I can tell you is that the combinatorics of the cones and sigma themselves control sort of the boundary stratification of AG bar sigma. And for that reason, it's going to be interesting to us to um, study that combinatorics en route to studying the top weight cohomology of AG, thanks to the identification that I mentioned up here. So I may as well prep <coughs> then the tropical moduli space, AG trot sigma. At the moment, the construction depends on the choice sigma. So the construction is as follows. You know, one way to say it is, is the following. You take every single cone sigma i in this decomposition of omega g rational. And then you glue them, you glue them as follows. So for every cone sigma j, um, here, do I have a picture? Not obviously. So you might have some cone sigma j and some other cone sigma i, you know, within your picture, within your admissible decomposition. And a element, say a of glgz, sorry, I keep uh, writing the wrong thing here. This is the conjugation action. Um, an element A that takes sigma J to a face of sigma I. And for all, so, so we take a diagram whose objects are the cones and whose morphisms are sort of all such face identifications and we take the co-limit. Maybe a more concrete way of saying this is that this is some kind of so AG trap sigma is some kind of generalized cone complex. So it's built from cones glued under face maps. There's one cone for each orbit under the general linear group of cones um, in sigma. And they're glued, um, um, you know, well, exactly in this way. So taking the action of GLGZ uh, into account. So continuing the cartoon in the genus two case, it just so happens in the genus two case that for each dimension k from k, like k equals zero, one, two, and three, all of the k dimensional cones are in the same orbit under GL two z. That's special to the case two. And so in a fairly accurate picture actually of a two trap. Sigma um, for sigma is drawn um, in the upper right. It's um, you know so if I draw it not by taking not taking the link, it's some kind of single barycentric cell um, out of a triangular cone. So if I drew it sort of in accordance with the top right picture by passing to the link, I would draw essentially one sixth of a triangle. It would be a triangle modulo the action of S three. So maybe I should remark in case there, you know, in case this is of interest. What it sounds like is that I made a very convoluted definition of what is simply the quotient of the cone omega G rational by the action of GLGZ. And indeed, it's true from my description that point by point, you know, the, the set of points underlying AG trap sigma is just the set of GLGZ orbits um, on omega G rational. So that's true you know, as an equality of sets, but it's not true that AG trap sigma is the literal you know, topological quotient. So one has to do a sort of combinatorial gluing um, as, in the, as in the box, as in the description in the box. The rough idea is that, you know, if you look at the way like in this picture, for instance, if you look at how GL2Z is acting, 
you know, you have essentially accumulation points. You have some failure of, of local finiteness at the boundary. And so one really needs to separate out the cones combinatorially and take a sort of combinatorial quotient rather than taking naively this quotient of topological, of, of, of a topological space. Yeah, I don't know if that's conceptually um, convincing. Um, I think a very rough analogy would be the following. If you're trying to, if you consider like M1 or M11, the moduli of elliptic curves, you might make that as the quotient of the upper half plane. And if you then wanted to um, sort of extend that construction to make a M11 bar, um, before quotienting, you would have to add a bunch of points, which are then identified under the action of SL2Z. You would have to add, uh, if I'm getting this right, a point at infinity and all of the sort of rational points on the real axis of the complex plane. But you don't want to do that in a way such that you get sort of accumulation points in the by taking the naive quotient by SL2Z. You have to sort of separate the points at infinity. This is a roughly analogous to what's happening here. Okay. So then let me assert again the, the, the main reason that we're studying this space at all. It's that the rational homology of this tropical moduli space, more precisely its link, is identified up to a degree shift with the cohomology and top weight, g squared plus g of Ag. One more remark, it sounded like perhaps the combinatorics of sigma played a role, um, but purely as a topological space, it doesn't. So it's a fact that if you have two admissible decompositions, sigma and sigma prime, um, there exists a common refinement. This I'm aware of is in the book of Fulting's Chai. I don't know if that's a correct first reference or not. And by passing to common refinements, it's not too hard to then show that the links are just homeomorphic as topological spaces. So in some sense, there is just one tropical moduli space, AG. All right. So in like five minutes or so, I wanna to specialize to my favorite sigma and that will make this construction perhaps even more combinatorially concrete. Before doing that though, let me continue with a arbitrary sigma and just discuss the existence of a cellular chain complex in the sense of symmetric CW complexes. So just some rational chain complex that computes the rational homology of this link. And I mean, it should very much bring to mind CW complexes or related constructions. So let me now define the cellular chain complex. So in degree D, it is generated, oops, sorry. Okay, in degree D, it's generated by cones of dimension D plus one. The plus one is not important, that's a degree convention. One per GLGZ orbit, so pick, if you wish, some orbit representatives. And we only consider the cones that are alternating. So in some sense, this is like an analog of the sort of um, odd uh, convention on edges of a graph. When I say alternating, I mean the following. I'll call the cone alternating if whenever an element of GLGZ acts on it and fixes it setwise, the um, resulting transformation is orientation preserving. So for example, if you had a triangular cone, a cone over a triangle and some element of uh, GLGZ flipped it, that would not be an alternating transformation. And I would not take uh, such a cone as a generator in this chain complex. Okay, now I have to um, tell you the differential and it's like, a bit of bookkeeping, but it's very much in line with um, the differential you might expect um, in analogy to graph complexes. So to do it precisely, let me choose a reference orientation for the representatives of 
the GLGZ orbits that I've chosen. It's just orient each cone arbitrarily, just for reference. And then if you use the action of GLGZ to sort of extend your orientation, you can extend this orientation to an orientation of every single alternating cone. I'm really using that the cones in question are alternating. So in other words, if I have an orientation on a cone and two different ways to move that cone to another one using the action of GLGZ, then the two induced orientations are the same precisely because the cones in question are alternating. Okay. This is sort of annoying to describe, but it is, you know, how to make this differential that I have to describe now precise. So then the differential on my chain complex is um, so it's more or less a sort of oriented sum of the facets, the one dimensional faces. So if sigma is a cone, like the triangle that's cartooned on the right, then the boundary of, of sigma here is the sum over all um, cones sigma prime, um, which are generators in degree d minus one, weighted by a certain number that I've temporarily denoted delta of sigma comma sigma, sigma prime comma sigma. This delta is more or less a count of the number of times sigma prime occurs as a face of sigma. So let me make that precise. So in general, like is in this picture, sigma prime might be nowhere near sigma, but it is possible, and this is the case of interest, that sigma prime is GLGZ equivalent to a face of sigma. Could even be equivalent to more than one face of sigma. That's possible because of the various sort of self-identifications provided by the action of the general linear group. In any case, for each such identification, like as drawn here in orange, I um, attach a either plus or minus one. So it's a signed count of the number of sort of face incidences, the number of ways, the number of times that sigma prime is sort of glued to sigma in the tropical moduli space. Okay, so again, this um, every time you have such a gluing, you get a plus or minus one. And that plus or minus one actually, to be very careful, keeps track of whether the orientation on this actual face row agrees or disagrees with the one induced by the orientation on sigma. Okay, so in general, you would expect the differential to, you know, if you write it out as a matrix with respect to these chosen basis elements, you would expect it to mostly be filled with one zeros and minus ones, but a priori that need not be the case because again, with all the self-identifications in play, you could have a cone, as far as I know, that is a face of a bigger cone in, in multiple ways. Okay. So, right, and here I should um, again reference the, the formalism that was provided in the work of Alcott, Corey, Payne. Using that formalism, we deduce that the homology of this chain complex that I'm temporarily denoting C sub G sigma depends on the input data sigma. The homology of this cone complex is identified. It's the cellular homology, essentially, of the topological space length of AG trop. And again, just as a reminder, this is how we access the top weight cohomology of AG. Um, and again, that last isomorphism is essentially the same as what was explained in the talk of Sam Payne. And that's why we're interested in this sort of um, combinatorial complex here on the left. Now let me specialize further and pick my favorite choice of sigma and tell you about it. So that is as follows. My favorite one is the one listed first in this list of three. So there are three famous choices of admissible decomposition. I think they're all you know, about 100 years old. 
And in the literature, they're called the first Voronoi or perfect decomposition, the second Voronoi decomposition, and the central cone decomposition. And it's the first one that's my favorite for the purpose of this talk, because it allowed us to connect to existing computations of Voronoi complexes in, uh, by EVGS. So I'm just going to define it straight up. I won't prove that it's an admissible decomposition, but it's quite pleasant, I think. So again, my goal now is to define an admissible decomposition of omega-g rational. So it goes like this. First, consider all perfect forms, Q. Um, so perfect quadratic forms on R to the G. Let me explain what I mean by perfect. A form is called perfect if it's essentially uniquely determined, determined up to scaling by a positive real number, by its set of minimal vectors, which are defined to be the following set of non-zero lattice vectors. So the minimal vectors of a form Q are by definition those non-zero lattice points X that minimize X, sorry, minimize Q among all non-zero lattice points Y. Um, do I have a, yeah, I have an example. Let me just scroll forward to the example. So for example, I claim that this Q, so when G equals two, two the, uh, the form Q of XY equals X squared plus Y squared plus XY is perfect. So I claim that its minimal vectors are, uh, let me do a different color, are these six. You can just sort of compute by hand to convince yourself, I think. So the value at these six points of Q is one and the value at all other non-zero lattice points is bigger. And then the claim that Q is perfect is precisely the claim that any form with that set of minimal vectors is but a scalar multiple of Q. Okay, so returning to the main thread, consider all perfect forms Q. And for each perfect form, let me tell you a cone that I'll call sigma Q. It's um, a polyhedral cone with rays um, corresponding to so the rays are, are the G by G symmetric rank one matrices of the form X, X transpose. So here X ranges over the set of minimal vectors of Q. And taking all such cones sigma of Q and all their faces provides, I assert without proof, an infinite polyhedral decomposition and exactly an admissible decomposition of omega G rational. So let me give you an example of a particular sigma Q. If you take the Q in, in, this, in the box, then sigma of Q is, you know, the, the cone um, where the, you know, its rays, its extremal rays are exactly the two by two rank one matrices. Oh, sorry, let me, so let me write down the minimum vectors just so that uh, we can compute without thinking. So the minimal vectors in this case are as shown in the picture. It's plus or minus one zero, plus or minus zero one, and plus or minus uh, one minus one. So then sigma of Q is the cone through the um, two by two matrices, one zero, 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 one, and one minus one minus one. One. So in other words, it's this cone right here. Okay. And so this is the perfect cone uh, uh, admissible decomposition. And then here are some, I don't know if these are helpful cartoons or unhelpful cartoons, but they're cartoons of the resulting spaces. So here, this is a, a picture in the case G equals two of AG trop on the left, and then the link, which is essentially a slice on the right. So the assertion in particular is that all of these triangular cones are in the same 
GLG, GL2Z orbit as the sigma of Q that I drew here. And moreover, there are elements of GL2Z that sort of um, permute the three rays of this triangular cone freely. Okay. So let me now pass to, um, oh, sorry. So notation wise, I'll specialize the notation a little further. I'll let P G um, denote the, what we'll call the perfect complex. So in the notation just a moment ago, it was the chain complex that I described before associated to the perfect cone decomposition. So again, roughly speaking, it has a generator for every alternating perfect cone, every perfect cone such that the GLGZ action is orientation preserving in that cone. Okay. So here's essentially the main technical theorem that we're um, proving in our, one of the main technical theorems in, in our paper that we're able to relate the perfect cone complex in genus G and the perfect cone complex in genus G minus one with a known or at least sort of studied complex called the Voronoi complex. So here VG denotes the Voronoi complex for GLGZ um, in the sense of Elbaz, Vincent, Gang, Soule. And um, the quickest way for me to try to define this VG is maybe to appeal to the short exact sequence, especially since I've given you kind of a, a description of PG. So in the picture above, maybe this big picture here, um, you know, roughly speaking, PG has a generator for every alternating cone in the picture. And one of the contributions of our talk is to identify the cones in PG, sorry, the cones in the perfect cone compactification that lie entirely in the, the boundary. So in other words, who, the cones whose matrices are all of deficient rank, not of full rank, with the, um, the cones underlying the tropical moduli space in genus G minus one. So in other words, this inclusion um, of chain complexes, PG minus one here into PG comes from seeing AG minus one trop inside AG trop. And the Voronoi complex, I mean, for the purpose of this talk, you can define it as the co-kernel. What is actually the case is that we sort of check that there, you know, we compute that there really is a short exact sequence. So roughly speaking then, the Voronoi complex is generated by alternating cones in the perfect uh, cone decomposition, which do not lie entirely in the boundary of the round PSD cone. They meet the interior, they meet the open cone of positive definite matrices. So that's this complex VG. And this was studied in quite remarkable computer calculations of the paper I've referenced. Um, as I understand it, the purpose of this paper is to sort of compute cohomology of you know, SLNZ and GLNZ. And precisely what it actually computes is the homology with appropriate degree shift of GLGZ with rational Steinberg coefficients. As I understand, it's a theorem from uh, Soule. Um, you can also see EBGS. So taking this theorem as true for a moment, let me now show you the following. Oh yeah, okay. So what is the spectral sequence? So um, we can, so in the paper we study just the short exact sequence shown here straight up, um, but it's a bit more efficient. Um, and I have been learning this through conversations with the collaborators I mentioned. So I'm grateful to their their influence. It's a bit more efficient just to look at the sort of filtration of this perfect cone complex by the smaller perfect cone complexes. Um, and associated to this filtered complex, there is of course a spectral sequence. And because of the assertion here in this theorem, the 
groups on the E1 page of the spectral sequence associated to this filtered complex are exactly the homology groups of the Voronoi complex VG. Okay, so now let me show you the E1 and the E2 pages of the spectral sequence associated to the filtered complex in the box. So they look like this. So here I'm doing a special case, the case G equals seven. It doesn't really matter, but just for illustration. So again, this is the spectral sequence associated to this filtration of the perfect co complex in, in dimension seven, genus seven. So again, the E1 page, I didn't have to do anything for. I, what I had to do was copy over the data from um, previous papers um, on homology groups of Voronoi complexes. So let me try to be clearer about what is coming from what. Um, so the computations in the columns uh, five, six, and seven here are the computations from EVGS and they're quite remarkable, like huge computer calculations. Then there's some vanishing results from the um, four author paper I mentioned before. And then this result, it's essentially due to Lee Charba um, from their paper in 78. But as far as we could tell when working this project, they worked it out for SL and we needed the results for GL and we couldn't quite see it from there. So we worked out that case. I think it constitutes a plugging a tiny, tiny gap in the literature, um, if I'm not mistaken. Anyways, this is the totality of what's known about Voronoi complexes and their homology on the E1 page. And then a very sort of blunt way to summarize a big chunk of what we do in the paper is we explain how to go from the E1 page to the E2 page which is now computing homology of perfect, the perfect um, complex. So in particular, we can show that um, you get convergence exactly at the E2 page um, for reasons that are, there, there is a conceptual reason for that called you know, the acyclicity of a certain inflation complex, but let me not discuss those precise details in this talk. But in particular, when you go, go to the E2 page, so here I'm just truncating, you imagine you truncate at the G equals seven, just for illustration, that would tell you the, on the E2 page, the homology of P7. And in fact, the E2 page is all concentrated in that last column, G equals seven, P equals, uh, P equals seven, I guess. So that's a way of summarizing what we do in our paper, very, very um, sort of roughly. And putting together all those computations, so the one above computed the perfect um, complex homology for G equals seven, but doing it for, you know, P equals zero through seven, you get the following data. So to be more concrete and without mentioning spectral sequences, this is just a table form of the, the, the results on top weight cohomology that I mentioned, that I announced at the beginning of this talk. So in particular, the results for five, six, and seven are the ones here in the fifth, sixth, and seventh columns. There are indeed odd classes, I guess, here. And actually, this is hard to pick out, I think, this one and this one. And the one here is Haynes class um, in A3 in top weight. And there are vanishing results. So for example, there's nothing below the p-axis because of virtual cohomological dimension computations, actually either for symplectic groups or for general linear groups, the two sort of line up. Moreover, there's, um, you know, apart from this class here in the zero, zero, there is vanishing in that bottom row, which again is implied by either, by two theorems, which are consistent, the theorem on Gunnel, by Gunnels or the theorems by Lee and Charba, which tell you about vanishing of cohomology either of SP2GZ or of GLGZ in the virtual cohomological dimension. And there's also a vanishing of that Q equals one row here implied by a theorem of Church-Putman, uh, which is, again, it's a theorem on vanishing one below the cohomological dimension of GLGZ. And as I understand it, there's sort of work in progress by a group of people who, um, so uh, Brook, Patz, and Schroka who are looking at vanishing of 
the um, the um, the rational cohomology of symplectic groups in one below the virtual cohomological dimension. So this should all match up. Okay. Yeah. So this. Sorry. This maybe this comment is misplaced here. Let me just erase it. So this is in some sense a table of the results obtained so far. Okay. Let me trespass just a moment if I can on the most interesting part for me, which is this conjectural part um, of what in, interpreting this table actually is an E1 page of a spectral sequence. And I'm very grateful to Ursula Tomasi for explaining her viewpoint on this. So it goes like this. So by Poincaré duality, this could have been a table of weight zero compactly supported cohomology groups of AGs. And it actually is the E1 page of a spectral sequence whose further pages are you know, conjectural, corresponding to the Sataki compactification of AG. The Sataki compactification or the bailey borel compactification is not a compactive, it's not a toroidal compactification of AG. For the purpose of this talk, the important thing to know is that it admits stratification into AG, AG minus one, and so on up to A0. Now, the stable cohomology of the Sataki compactification is understood thanks to work of Charney Lee. So in particular, it's this you know, infinite polynomial ring. It has some algebraic classes. These are essentially churn classes of a certain extension of a Hodge bundle. Those are not in weight zero. But then there are these classes that are, I think, hard, at least for me, to understand y6, y10, y14, and so on. And these are in weight zero, as shown in work of Chen Lohenga. So these y's, again, are weight zero classes in the cohomology ring of A.G. Sataki. So now you can consider the spectral sequence computing the cohomology of A.G. Sataki, whose E1 page has in it the compactly supported cohomology groups of the strata, the locally closed strata, in this case, exactly the AGs. And this is a spectral sequence that makes sense in the category of mixed Hodge structures. So I will be interested in its weight zero um, subspace. So the weight zero sort of part of it. And this is the conjectural picture. So um, the stuff on the left is true, and the stuff on the right is um, a conjecture. But it's reasonable to conjecture that what we're seeing here on the diagonal are classes that persist and become the polynomials in the Ys um, that are predicted you know, by the Charney-Lee um, uh, computations, or the Charney-Lee theorem. And there are a couple of really tantalizing things. Again, this the sort of convergence here, like the exact picture for E infinity is conjectural, but it makes sense. There are lots of things we could guess, like one could easily just look at this and guess that below the P equals Q diagonal, there are no, um, the, no non-zero groups. And there are also other interesting things to guess. So for example, we had, again, these odd degree cohomology um, groups, which must die by the time you reach the infinity page, uh, just because at e infinity, we know there's nothing in odd degree. So they must pair with something in even degree that hasn't sort of, that isn't going to be detected on the e infinity page. This would also be interesting. And uh, in reference to this morning's talk, I think you can see a couple of the, the sort of wedges of two forms apparent in this diagram. I think this one, this one, and this one maybe, uh, but I didn't prepare that precisely. Okay, um, so I think this sort of conjectural sort of precise connection or more precise connection to the cohomology of A.G. Sataki um, really situates with, with increased interest some of, the, some of the results we obtained. Okay, sorry for going over. Um, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Questions and remarks, please. Since Eric, I can't 